Someone recently asked me to do a video on the never-ending chase for more and how to stop wanting to constantly make upgrades and spend money. She actually phrased it as an issue with being a perfectionist. If everything wasn't of a certain quality, she felt as though her decluttering process had somehow failed. I think that more than perfectionism, this tends to be an issue with discontentment. The question is, why do we always want more and when does the chasing end? Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel, and if you're new here, then welcome. My name is Mia Danielle, and I chat all about holistic and clutter-free spaces. So if that's something you're into, be sure to click subscribe and turn on those notifications so you'll be notified when I release a new video every Tuesday. Now, before I start shredding the concept of discontentment, I'd like to point out that there are appropriate and healthy times to be discontent. For example, if you're living in a sewer, unless you needed to find acceptance in that location for survival, discontentment is a totally healthy and natural response to that situation. If you're living in an abusive or dangerous environment, discontentment is a healthy response to that and is likely your brain's way of indicating to you that a change needs to be made. I personally don't believe that it's bad to even want things and to have goals and plans for things in your future, as long as it's not interfering with your current level of life satisfaction. We're not talking about the healthy kinds of discontent today. We're talking about the other kind, the kind that keeps you feeling like what you have is never enough. It's never good enough and that you need to have or do more in order to be happy and successful, or that mindless droning for more on autopilot. I see desire and discontent as a self-feeding cycle. We're discontent, so we desire, and we desire, so we're discontent. You feel this initial lacking, and that lacking leaves us susceptible to desire, often of things that we hadn't even considered prior and that have absolutely nothing to do with the source of the initial lacking. Suddenly your discontentment shifts from that initial lacking to the lacking of the newly desired thing. Here's an example. You're bored, i.e. lacking in mental stimulation. So you fixate on something that you want. Like, let's say you desire a dress. Life would be so much cooler if you had that dress. Then you feel discontent again, this time because you don't have the dress. So you buy the dress, and then the next time that you get that sensation of lacking, you won't fixate on the dress that you already own, you'll desire something new. And so the cycle goes. If this whole paradox of discontentment and desire sounds familiar, it's because it isn't new. The entire religion of Buddhism is based on the paradox of suffering and the idea that suffering is inevitable and that it's caused by desire. Buddhist principles are based largely in learning how to ditch the desire and become comfortable with discomfort, or the much less pleasant term, suffering. About a month ago, I shared a video on how to adapt to living with less, and I talked about what the author of the book Flow, Csikszentmihalyi, had to say about desires. His stance is that we have biological desires and social desires, and that the discontent happens when we allow those desires to rule rather than using our handy-dandy special human skill of controlled consciousness, i.e. self-control. But not just self-control over your actions, also self-control over the way that you think and prioritize, placing those higher priorities and values above your desires not doing the thing that part of our brain wants us to do because the more intentional part of our brain with goals and stuff says no. Okay, cool. So I'm basically saying to have self-control and to stop wanting stuff, right? Well, in a sense, but there's more to it than that. In order to be more effective, it really helps to understand where the initial discontent comes from. For example, boredom. It happens, we all experience it, but the good question is, what do we do about it? There's been a lot of research showing that boredom is actually a good thing. Veritasia made a pretty compelling video about the benefits of boredom and what we're giving up when we disallow it. For example, studies show that our most creative thoughts and altruistic acts tend to spring from moments of boredom. In this case, changing your stance on boredom could be a barrier to general discontentment and the desire for more. I find that when I'm bored and fidgety, I tend to naturally notice things around me that I wanna change. Maybe they've been there for a really long time and are totally acceptable, but now that I'm bored, they nag at me. My bedside tables are too green. They really shouldn't be that green. Actually, talking about how things should or shouldn't be brings me to another cause for initial discontent, misaligned expectations. 
This can stem from so many different sources. If your parents had a lot of money, you might have the feeling that what you have will never be good enough until it matches or surpasses what they had. Maybe that one has a lot of baggage, but it's not that far off from the truth for many people. The idea of keeping up with someone else is a social struggle that is not rare by any means and in any demographic. A while back, I shared some of my own struggles with this as a YouTuber in this Instagram post. I talked about how I occasionally catch myself being discontent now that I'm sharing my space with the public. This little voice in my brain chimes in saying that something could be better. My throw pillows could be nicer. My plant pots could be more stylish. Or as I said in this post, are my salt and pepper shakers really video ready? The best thing that you can do for this is to increase mindfulness and to get out of your head. Sometimes I verbally tell myself no, which has become a little weird, but also it works. No, what I have is enough. The important thing to realize is that enough always has and always will be relative. I like the way the author of Flow puts it. When Cyrus the Great had 10,000 cooks preparing new dishes for his table, the rest of Persia had barely enough to eat. These days, every household in the first world has access to recipes of the most diverse lands and can duplicate the feasts of past emperors. But does this make us more satisfied? Now, perfectionism is a tough one because true perfectionism is detrimental and a very unhappy way to live. Nothing in your home is ever good enough. You get the desire for something new and it's likely not good enough either. And this cycle just continues over and over again for no real reason. And I think that part is important. There's no real reason. It's not that you're effectively upgrading your space. It's more of a fixation and an inability to relax and enjoy what you have. I think that when most people say that they're perfectionist, it's not really an issue of perfectionism so much as a more common misalignment of expectations like we just talked about. Perfectionism is a delusion. And I can say this without hesitation because I used to live in that delusion and that made me miserable. There were years where I couldn't sustain a healthy relationship because no relationship ever maintained its perfection. Being a perfectionist is nothing to brag about. And I think that as a culture, just like the word busyness, we should de-glamor the word perfectionist. To be totally clear, because I know a lot of people have misconceptions about this, minimalism is not at all related to perfectionism. I actually have an entire blog post that I'll probably do a video on at some point called, Is Minimalism Basically Perfectionism? And in short, the answer is no, but I break down how minimalism is actually the opposite of perfectionism in some pretty key ways. So why is all of this discontentment a thing? Matt Diavella actually has a video where he interviews Dr. Rick Hansen, who I'm a huge fan of. I've mentioned his name many times myself. He's the author of Hardwiring Happiness. And he asked, what do you think is the biggest factor for most people's discontent? To which Dr. Hansen replied, greed. Now, I'm not saying that this is an untrue assumption, but I do believe that there's more to it than that. To me, greed indicates something deviant, which indicates something intentional. And I think that most of the time, we just don't even realize this desire for more is happening. He does go on to say something that sounds much more likely to me, that it's a biologically based delusional craving. He said that auto craving is a good strategy to keep animals alive, including early humans in really harsh conditions. But today it creates a disconnect. As the author of Flow says regarding what he calls social desires, as long as we're responding predictably to what feels good and what feels bad, it's easy for others to exploit our preferences for their own needs, i.e. modern day marketing and sales. So what can we do about this? The author of Flow recommends that you practice self-directed consciousness, self-control strengthened with mental practices and mindfulness. Dr. Rick Hansen suggests in the remainder of his interview with Matt Diavella that you can internalize that you truly are safe and that you have what you need regarding three main principles, safety, satisfaction, and connection. He says that by internalizing and truly believing and feeling that you're covered in all three of those areas, the desire for more starts to fade away. You could also use what I call voodoo methods of altering your behavior for your results. Some of those things I mentioned in this video on how to stop bringing in clutter, such as developing a practice of wishlisting items for a period of time before following through with purchasing. In general, it all comes down to your thoughts, your beliefs, and your behaviors. 
So what do you think? Can we dampen our drive for more and our general discontentment? And how would that look? If you enjoyed this conversation, be sure to give it a thumbs up. And if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe and turn on those notifications. I'll catch you here next week.